If you are feeling chronically stressed and super anxious, burnt out, and you want to understand why and how you got to that state, and perhaps most importantly, how to get out of it, this episode is just for you. Today, I am delighted to introduce you to Dr. Dave Rabin, a board-certified psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and the co-founder of Apollo Neuroscience. Dr. Rabin has over 15 years of experience studying the impact of chronic stress and anxiety. He is the chief innovation officer at Apollo Neuroscience, a company that developed the first scientifically validated wearable technology to improve sleep, relaxation, and focus. So if you want to learn life-changing strategies to manage your stress before it becomes chronic and to manage your anxiety before you burn out, make sure to listen to this fascinating conversation. I hope you will enjoy the show as much as I've enjoyed recording it with Dr. Dave. Dr. Dave, I am thrilled to welcome you on the show today. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Excellent. I was hoping we could drive straight in into a topic that we all know so much about and we would like to have a lot less of, chronic stress and anxiety. Can you tell us more about those two things that tend to run our lives? Sure. Uh, I think this is a great place to start because stress is often misunderstood uh, because we think of it as something that's always bad. And stress is actually not always bad. It's also required for personal growth. And in neuroscience, we kind of divide stress into two categories. There's eustress, which is spelled E-U stress, which means good stress. And then there's bad stress, which is distress. And distress and eustress can switch between each other based on our mindset, our perspective, the situation we're in, how well we're supported in the situation, whether we feel safe or afraid when we're stressed out. So all of these things can contribute to whether, whether we're experiencing stress that promotes personal growth and development, or whether we're experiencing stress that promotes illness, disease, dysfunction. Uh, and chronic stress, like the kind of stress that many of us are exposed to every single day, most moments of the day, uh, which we also kind of equate with increasing anxiety, uh, which is really, anxiety is really the feeling of being out of control. Um, this is distressed over time, right? So it's like bad stress times time. And that is very, very bad for our bodies. It leads to, again, illness, mental and physical illness. It leads to burnout um, and it can lead to uh, even death in people. And so I think as of 2018 or 2017, the statistics were showing that in the U.S. alone, uh, there are over 125,000 deaths a year that are attributed to stress, distress, um, which is a way, way too large a number. And th so there's a real connection between the way we experience stress and the way and the impact on our bodies and our bodies functioning and how good we feel. And so understanding that we can shift our perspective uh, of stress by feeling safe. Uh, safety is really the key word here is that if we feel safe and in control, which most of us are actually in control of a lot more of than we think we are or than we were taught, then we can start to transform things that uh, cause what we feel like chronic stress or distress into opportunities for personal growth. Um, and, and that is, can really start with ask, you know, asking one question when we start to experience stress, because all of us have stress all the time. It never goes away, right? Stress is always there. It's just different. It comes in different forms at different times, different speeds, intensities, et cetera. So the, the first question to ask is, you know, what can I learn from this experience? right? How, how, is, how can I look at this experience and find gratitude for it, even though it might be really challenging or hard, and figure out how I can learn from it, learn to grow from it, and become a better, stronger version of myself through it. Do you think that in a corporate cultural environment, we have a tendency to glorify stress by being so proud to be super busy? I hear a lot of executives saying, 
almost as if it was something to be proud of. I'm back to back. I'm always busy. I'm always on the run. Do you think we've glorified it? Uh, yeah, I think we, I think we, I think it's not that we've glorified stress. It's that we've glorified, um, overworking ourselves mm -hmm. and overworking yourself can be, <clears throat> can be like an addiction, right? Because the, the, uh, idea of addiction that is, I, I'm also an addiction psychiatrist. And one of the mis most common misunderstandings about addiction is that we can become addicted to basically anything. Uh, it's not just drugs. It can also include gambling, earning money, sex, work, uh, video games. It can include lots of different things. And so the reason why is not because the activity itself is addictive. It's because the way we're using the activity, like work, overwork, for instance, is to distract ourselves from discomfort in our lives. So if we are working to push ourselves too hard all the time to distract ourselves from things about our lives or ourselves that we're unhappy with, then that is not a healthy relationship with work. And so when we promote that kind of mentality around overworking at all costs, then we're not actually dealing with the core problem that's causing the, the distress. Uh, and so what happened, that's, that's actually one of the main reasons why people burn out is because where you know we have we do have a culture where we glorify work at work at all costs because in our society productivity and earning money are valued more than anything else even more so than being a good person which doesn't really make any sense so you get more reward in life from making money than you do from being a good person right so just think about how backwards that is and then you and then you now we have people you know, mil millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, maybe billions of people worldwide that are overworking themselves to distract themselves from discomfort, from other things that are already stressing them out that they haven't dealt with. And so what happens when you stop working? Well, you're, those things that were causing your stress are still there and they're still not processed or dealt with. And so the reason to, to work hard is because you love what you do, not because you want to just be more productive or just make money or just distract yourself from discomfort. It's because you really genuinely love what you do and it gives you enjoyment and it fulfills you. And if you get, if you approach work from that perspective, then work doesn't contribute to stress as much. Uh, it actually turns work into a you stress. It's a stress that helps us grow and become better. But if we're working to distract ourselves from discomfort, then the discomfort source, whatever that is, it could be past trauma, it could be challenges, other challenges in our lives we haven't dealt with, uh, it could be mental, spiritual, emotional, whatever it is, um, that source of stress is still there. And so that, when you, that combined with the stress of pushing ourselves too hard at work that's not fulfilling or that we don't love, we're just doing it for the money, um, that combination together is what creates this critical mass that eventually results in burnout for many people. Mm. What are the key signs or symptoms of becoming a workaholic in your experience? Mm. Well, becoming a workaholic, I mean, I think it's similar to any addiction, right? So it's putting work ahead of other things that are important in your life. So putting work ahead of taking care of yourself, showering and bathing, uh, taking care of your normal daily routine, eating right? Uh, spending time with family and friends, uh, neglecting other parts of your life for work. And I think that's one of the first things that happens. Uh, one of the other things that we see that happens a lot is irritability. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't realize that when you are expressing frustration or irritability towards people that you care about and that you don't want to show that to, uh, that's often because we're distracted by other things that other commitments, work related commitments, whatever it is that are taking our attention away from being present with the people that we care about most. And nothing in life is more important than having good relationships with people, right? It doesn't, if, if it's your family, your friends, your, your romantic partner uh, or partners, whatever it is, right? Like nothing's more important than that. Work will not love you back right? Money does not love you back. Productivity does not love you back. So 
you know, you can do all of these things, but if you don't, if you're sacrificing the relationships in your life for work, money, et cetera, then, and you're, and, and that the first sign of that is really irritability. It's like being frustrated with people, being short with people, not having patience with people. Um, and that you start to see your relationships suffer, the quality of your relationships suffer, the closeness start to suffer. That's the first sign of workaholism. It's also the first sign of every addiction, mm. it, every addiction with any drug, with anything. So, so that is, and it's because we're seeking distraction from discomfort. So you stop working, you still have the discomfort from whatever it was that you're just, you're trying to distract yourself by. And then that results in you not being able to be present with people because you're distracted all the time by discomfort and stress. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. I, I'm a former workaholic and I love your explanation because I've seen so many parallels. Now, in, when I do clinical hypnotherapy, I work a lot with substance abuse and I've actually noticed patterns that are similar to my former patterns with work. So I would love to run this example by you and to hear your thoughts or insights on that. I had impulses around devices that related to my work. So I could not control my impulse. If I had a phone, if I had a laptop, I had this urge, deep, deep impulse to keep on working. And I would go as far as lying as to what I was doing on my devices. So when my ex-husband at 3 a.m. was like, what are you doing? Oh, sweetie, don't worry, I'm, I'm online shopping. I wasn't, I was hiding the fact that I was working. And that's so similar to someone that can't be trusted with a bottle of wine or hiding in the toilet to drink it, right? Ex exactly, yeah, it's, the lying is also a very early sign. When you feel like you're, you're ashamed of telling somebody that you're working, right? There's a reason because you, part of you feels like you shouldn't be working. And so you, lie about it and that's a very early sign if you notice that you can't be honest about what it is you're spending your time doing with people you care about then that is also going to compromise the relationships with those people mm. right mm. so if i understand correctly the sequence in your experience is developing that form of addiction then there is the onset of distress that is going to cause anxiety that is going to link to chronic stress and then we have the burnout syndrome. So, so the, yes, and there's stuff and? that comes earlier, right? Okay, so, the, <laughs> so the stuff that comes earlier is that is 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 the distress itself, right? So the stress, so the the source of stress comes in. Like there's too much demand on me, right? I have too many people asking me for things. I have too many responsibilities. I have too much, too fast going on in my life, and then we, uh, or the other form could be, I had, so I had something hard happen to me when I was a kid and like I was, you were, I was bullied in school or somebody treated me badly and I never really got over it or I was abused and I don't want to think about that. So rather than processing that, ch that experience from childhood or from the traumatic experience and working through it and resolving it, we say that's too uncomfortable to think about. So, and I don't have anybody to think, to pro help me process it. So I'm just going to distract myself from it by working or spending money or earning money. Right. And so it's really the discomfort. It's the discomfort that's at the source of the problem. And it's the, it's the ignoring of the discomfort or the, dis or the repression or suppression of the discomfort that is what results in seeking relief from dis with distraction. So then and that creates the spiral. So if we, so what we teach in psychotherapy that is very, very important is the, is at the foundation of all of this, which is that you have to feel your feelings, even if they're uncomfortable, those feelings are there for a reason, right? They're even, even feelings like anger, frustration, sadness, fear, right? All of shame, guilt, all of these things are real feelings and they are there for a reason. They're there to be felt. And if you, even if they're uncomfortable. So if you ignore the feeling or, or suppress the feeling and you just don't, you don't feel it, then the feeling gets trapped in your body and it never leaves until you feel it. So you're constantly doing things to distract yourself from that feeling of discomfort, whatever it might be the source. 
And then that creates the vicious cycle of addiction to work or anything else. Mm. And do you think that's the reason why very often work addiction leads to many other forms of addiction? So my typical yeah. client will be a workaholic to start with, and then will develop some kind of substance abuse, be it drug, pharmaceutical, or otherwise recreational. And then it can be alcohol, it can be also online shopping. It can be all forms. Tell us more about this connection and how often an addiction lead to another. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, so the, the easiest way to summarize it is that um, impulsivity, impulsivity breeds impulsivity. So the more you do anything, this is from Eric Kandel's research uh, or an extrapolation of Eric Kandel's research, who's one of the most famous neuropsychiatrists of the 20th century who won the Nobel Prize in 2000 for discovering how we learn and remember things. And that the way that we as humans learn and remember things is the same way that ancient, ancient reptiles learn and remember things. So it's highly conserved pathways of the nervous system that have been around for over 300 million years. And what the whole synopsis of what he discovered is that practice makes perfect. Practice makes mastery, no matter what you do. So if you, and this is, this is also not well taught. So most people like don't understand that when our parents were telling us when we're young that practice makes perfect, it's actually true. Um, and that if you practice anything, then you get better at it. So if you practice distracting yourself from discomfort, which is what we would call discomfort intolerance, right? The, the not impulsive behavior would be to sit with the feeling of discomfort, even though it doesn't feel good, allow it like become aware of it, notice where you feel uncomfortable in your body, notice what thoughts come up and then acknowledge them and let them pass. And then usually what happens is within about 120 seconds or so of feeling your uncomfortable feelings, there's an answer that comes up, which is this is what you need to do to get this feeling out of your body. I feel sad. I need to cry. I feel angry. I need to go for a run right? Something like that happens. I'm tired and exhausted. I need to sleep, right? There's different, different answers will come to you naturally about what you need to do to process that emotion. I feel conflicted and guilty and shameful. I need to go talk to somebody about it, right? So all of these things, all these emotions, they have a way, a way to be processed naturally and get out. The problem is we're trained in our society to do the impulsive move, which is to avoid discomfort because we're taught that we're all supposed to feel comfortable all the time, but that's not true. That's not how life works. We're not supposed to be comfortable all the time. We're supposed to be comfortable as much of the time as possible and uncomfortable sometimes. Right. And then when we're uncomfortable, we're supposed to try to figure out healthy, natural ways to be comfortable again. So the process, the feeling and acknowledgement and then processing of emotions that happens naturally, just by starting out that process, by feeling what your feelings are, and sitting with them, not avoiding them, is what shifts the, the uh, process towards healing and growth rather than distress, chronic stress, and illness. Uh, and so, and we, we can do that. But impulsivity, the impulsive reaction is to say, I'm uncomfortable. I don't like this feeling. This feeling is bad. I shouldn't feel this way. I'm going to go distract myself from it somehow and try to gratify myself somehow with something else, work, sex, uh, drinking, drugs, video games, money, whatever it is, anything that distracts you from that feeling. And every time we engage in that behavior of impulsive distraction, then we're training our brains to seek distraction more. Does that make sense? Of course. So yes. it's like, you're, it's like you're training an, a feedback loop in your brain that says, I get relief Every time I'm upset, I have an ice cream yes. and then, and then, but then you're still upset because the reason why you're upset hasn't been solved. You just, you just soothe yourself an ice cream, but guess what? Multiply that times every time you're upset over days, weeks, months, years, and you become quite fat, right? And unhealthy. Yes. And so that's just a simple example, but we do that all the time. Food is a major source of distraction for humans. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what is really interesting is that we then pack it up as a system to operate 
at least I did. So my operating system, I thought it was brilliant at the time until I burnt out and completely collapsed was, okay, I can handle ungodly amount of work because I have a system. So my system was insomnia. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> I just figured what is the best way to work more and faster would just don't sleep. You know, for me, it was a thought of mathematical equation. When you're building by the minute, if you remove the minutes you sleep, then you don't sleep, you build more, right? Makes yeah, sense. You, yeah, you can, sleep, you can sleep when you're dead, right? <laughs> exactly. I thought I was being the smartest, but it uh, turns out not so much. <laughs> um, but the reason I'm bringing that up is I genuinely, Dr. Dave, did not realize how dangerous that coping mechanism was until I literally collapsed, as in like unable to stand up, collapse, right. complete blackout. And I'm just wondering, is there a way to become aware of where we're heading before something catastrophic happens? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and awareness is the key word, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's really, uh, awareness is like an infinite spectrum of, from zero awareness, I am asleep, passed out, not able to intake any information to completely 100% mindfully aware, which is like, you know, Buddhist monk status, right? And uh, the, we usually fall closer to, for most of us on the sleep side of the spectrum, because we're so distracted by all the different things going on inside and outside of us that we haven't learned to process effectively. And most of us haven't learned or practiced meditation or mindfulness techniques to be able to sift through our attention and expand our awareness uh, readily that we become unaware of the signs, the early signs. And the earliest signs are actually what you just said. It's sleep issues. So not being able to sleep or not getting enough sleep, um, waking up a lot in the middle of the night. Those are very early signs, feeling tired and exhausted during the day feeling irritable, like we mentioned earlier, um, short with people, having issues with your relationships that have always been good. Um, and then, and then other things that can come up like, like, um, physical signs, racing, racing heart, racing thoughts, um, sweating, um, you know, just feeling like, like no passion anymore for the work you do or for the things you used to love. You don't feel that anymore. You don't feel joy as much anymore, right? So those kinds of things are the early signs that precede burnout. And if we are aware of those, if we are aware of, of those things in our lives um, and how they're changing over time, not just accepting, oh, this is normal that I feel this way. It's normal that I'm not sleeping. It's like many of us have done. I've done it too. I've worked, you know, as medical, medical training, right? We didn't sleep sometimes for days, uh, and, or you maybe like a couple hours over days and it was really hard, but we always knew that we were doing this temporarily and that we were going to get lots of sleep afterwards. Right. So it wasn't like a prolonged thing. Um, and I think that's a big part of it is knowing that you have, you have to restore yourself. Uh, one of the, we always talk about prioritizing peak performance, but peak performance can't exist without peak recovery and peak recovery only happens when you get deep in REM sleep. So if you're not sleeping well or enough, um, and you're not getting that, that ultra restorative deep in REM sleep, which technically we're supposed to be spending about a third of our entire lives in sleep right? And then a third of that time in deep and REM sleep or a little more, if we're not getting that restorative sleep, we will burn out eventually. We will collapse eventually. We just can't go on. The body just runs out of resources. And so noticing these things, just having the awareness of, hey, I should be tracking how I'm sleeping and how my relationships are going and how my, how, you know, just how I'm feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. And if that starts to change, consistently it's getting worse and that's a sign that we need to slow slow things down and get more recovery definitely what are in your opinion some of the most holistic pragmatic tools to reduce that anxiety load for really time pressed really busy professionals uh so there are actually a lot of tools um the good news is most of them are free and most of them you can take with you anywhere you go um, so the first one is breath, right? 
And we, most of us are not taught how to breathe properly or even how to breathe intentionally by choice at all in Western culture. Um, in many other cultures, Eastern tribal cultures, they teach breathing from the moment people are able to speak like around, or maybe even before that around like one or two years old, kids are learning to breathe properly by choice. And it doesn't mean you always have to breathe by choice, but it means that if you're aware that you can and you practice breathing, then when you get stressed out or overwhelmed, uh, you can rapidly within as, as little as seconds to minutes, slow your breath down by just starting to breathe. And you could do this anywhere you are anytime, just breathe in through your nose or mouth for five seconds, and then breathe out through your nose or mouth for five seconds and just repeat that over and over and over again. And by the time you get to, you know, one, two, three minutes, you're usually feeling a lot calmer and more in control because you've just taken control of your breath. So if anxiety as a concept, if we think about it with the updated definition of anxiety is really feeling out of control uh, of our lives or, or of ourselves, um, then what happened, how do you reverse that, right? you reverse it by taking control of something and what you have and reminding yourself of what you have control over. And the very first thing is your breath. And, and in combination with that is your attention. So where, what am I paying attention to? Right? Like attention is actually a commodity in our society. It's the most, one of the most valuable things in existence. And if you are doubting what I'm saying, go look at any advertising company right? And look how they spend money on ads. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars on advertising placements to capture your attention so that you make a purchase of whatever it is they're selling, right? So it's literally an attention commodity. And, and the trick is to know that the neuro neuroscience has proven that, and of course, this is um, re, you know, emphasize also by Eastern and tribal medicine techniques is that we, every single human being has control over their own attention. We can control what we pay attention to in any moment, like our breath. Like we could be focused on worrying about the future in one moment. And then you can immediately say, I want to take a breath and focus on that. And you can do it. Whether, even if you think it's hard, even if you've never done it before, you can do it right now. Right. And there's nothing stopping you from doing it, except you not doing it or not believing that you can do it. Mm -hmm. So, so those are the two things that are really at the top of the list of, of what you can do to start to reverse the process of stress in the body, distress in the body to you stress and healing and growth and recovery states in the body. Uh, and when we do those techniques over and over and over again, no matter if you, especially if you do them when you're, when you're out, out and about in your regular life, then you, you're, you start to retrain your brain and rewire your brain to associate situations that used to feel stressful or fearful with safety. And then our decision-making ability goes up, our level of calm and clarity goes up, we feel in flow more of the time, we feel more at ease, shoulders come down, your heart rate comes down, your blood pressure comes down, it has a wide-ranging impact. Um, and so those are the, really the first two steps. And then there's other things that we can do that are natural that that amplify that. So like soothing music, listen, intentional, which we would call like, could put it in the category of like intentional listening. So it's choosing to listen to something. doesn't matter what it is, but you're choosing to do it. You're taking control over your attention. Um, intentional touch, right? So be giving, even just giving yourself a hug or holding, holding your, holding somebody's hand, consensually uh, giving somebody else a hug, receiving a hug from somebody you like, holding a pet, all of these things rapidly restore a sense of safety in the body almost instantly. And as soon as you restore that sense of safety, you've also restored control. And then your attention is on what it is you're feeling in your body right now, not on the past and not on the future. It's in the present. You've like taken your mind that could be past or future or present, and you've grounded it in your body instantly in the present. Mm -hmm. And then that restores your sense of control. And then over time, you've learned to feel more in control and to pay more attention to things you have control over because those are the things where we can actually change the outcome, right? We can't change the outcome of things we don't have control over. They might be distressing, they might be uncomfortable, but we can't change them because we don't have control over them. 
So control and safety are really at the core and all the techniques that we teach about sort of tap into that. I love what you say about control. And one of the feedback that I hear most often from clients is the reason I check my emails at 1 a.m. in bed is because it gives me a sense of control. And not being on my phone gives me more anxiety than being on my phone. So I just choose which anxiety because I'm going to be anxious anyway. I just choose the lesser of two evils. Turns out checking my phone gives me less anxiety than not having it. What would you say to that? So I think there's a, so, so I, I know those kinds of people. I, I have been that kind of person also. Um, but there's a fallacy in that thinking, which is that I'm going to be anxious anyway. So I'm going to do the thing that makes me feel less anxious. And that's the part that's not exactly true. So you don't have to be anxious anyway. The reason why we are anxious is because we're paying attention to things we can't control. So there's, there's, this is, there's, there's a lot of gray nuance, gray area nuance and nuance here, right? So if you are trying to fall asleep and there was something that you absolutely had to get done that day that requires a quick email send, and if you don't do it, it's going to have serious consequences the next day, then it's better to just go do it and then go to bed, right? That is the nuance. But if but if, but with respect to everything else that do, isn't absolutely urgent has to be done today, or there's going to be a serious consequence, all of the rest of those things can wait. And so the best thing to do, one of my techniques that I use myself with my patients is when I'm trying to fall asleep and I have a racing mind about all the things that I might not have gotten done that I know I need to get done. All the thing, if I, if I, uh, it usually almost all of them are things that don't need to be done right now. They're just things I know I need to do. And so I'll just take a pad and a paper, piece of paper and I'll just write down all the things and get them out of my head. And when I write them down, I know that I've saved them for tomorrow. It's like I'm extracting them from my brain, putting them onto a piece of paper. I know that piece of paper is going to be there tomorrow morning when I wake up, right? And I know also that I can't, I can't do all those things right now or I wouldn't sleep. So I need sleep to be able to function tomorrow. And if I don't get sleep, I'm not going to be my best self tomorrow and I might cause more problems than good. So if, if we accept that we must sleep and we must get good, deep, restful sleep to be able to function at our, at our peak or even close to it, then it requires us to start to make different decisions like instead of staying up and working all night and doing things that are not critically time sensitive or urgent, we just take them all, write them down, and then we come back to them tomorrow first thing and make sure to get them done then. But then we can go back into bed and say, this is the time I set aside to rest and recover. Mm -hmm. And then I can just focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you're trying to fall asleep in those situations, starting to change your, your attention from everything that you didn't get done to, everything I did great today, right? Just think about that mindset switch. It's very simple, but most of us haven't learned to do it or practiced it, but it's really, I could, I only have so much time to pay attention to anything right now. I'm trying to fall asleep. I know I need to sleep. I can spend that time thinking about all the things I did, did wrong or didn't do enough of, or that I still have yet to do, or I could take that same time and spend it thinking about all the things I did well, all the things I did great, all the things I'm grateful for that I are all that that are that are done, right? All the things I like about myself and my life, all the things I like about sleep, right? And if you start to if you just start to make that little switch in your attention, all of a sudden falling asleep becomes a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Have you ever come across the fact that somebody is putting all of this into place and really wants to learn, but has this deep rooted fear, particularly in a corporate context, that if they do slow down, they're suddenly going to become a little weaker or maybe not quite as hardworking and they won't be this, you know, badass super women or superman. And there is a genuine fear to therefore not be that top performing person and not get that promotion and not get this and not get that accolade and not get the next award. What do you think about that from a psychological standpoint? I think, I mean, it's a very, it's a very real fear 
right? Like this is especially in, in the world we're talking about that we live in, this modern world where earning money, productivity are more important and more valued in the business world than anything else. Lots of us are taught to have this fear. Um, but I think that what we often forget is that peak performance requires peak recovery, right? Mm -hmm. There, it's not optional. It's not optional. You can't sleep when you're dead. When you're dead, you're dead, right? It's not how it works. Like you have to, if you burn out without realizing that you're burning out, most people don't realize like you can't just wake up and go back to work the next day, excited and ready to go. You're burnt out. Like you need months off to recover because you've had a deficit of recovery for usually a really long time. And you can't just bounce right back. Your, your resilience has been knocked down. And so, you know, I think the, the main thing for everybody to know who's maybe stuck in thinking that way or has been thinking about themselves that way for a long time is that if we're not sleeping well every night and prioritizing good, deep, restful sleep and stress recovery, recovery in general, taking care of ourselves, um, we're going to make worse decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And the consequences of making bad decisions or not well thought through decisions because we're not recovered is potentially devastating, right? Like if you make a decision to take a shortcut because you're tired, right? Just a common example. I'm going to do it this way because this seems easier because I'm tired and I don't want to spend all the time I know I need to do to do it whatever, the right way. So I'm going to take the shortcut. Then you take the shortcut. And the outcome is you produce something that isn't good. It's not good enough to show anybody or you show it to your boss and your boss is like, this doesn't help me. This isn't what I wanted. You need to start over, right? Mm -hmm. So then what have you done? You just forced yourself to do it again and you just wasted a bunch of time, right? And you've also undermined your, the confidence of your boss in you because you submitted something to them that is not adequate, right? And so you've sat, you've literally, you've act by not sleeping and doing and, and like pushing yourself too hard or not recovering enough, you have compromised your decision-making ability and you have ultimately done things that actually make your life harder. Mm -hmm. And that is not the goal, right? Nobody wants that. That's, you know, we, the whole goal is to make your life easier with hard work, right? If you're going to put in a bunch of work to get something done, the outcome should be a reward, which is things get easier, better, you progress in a positive direction, not I have to redo this over again now, right? And I think that's a really hard lesson to teach people with words. A lot of the time, people have to learn through experience of making that mistake over and over and over again, where I know, you know, I know I've done that, where you try to, I try to take a shortcut and it ultimately leads me to have to restart and redo everything over again. And I've wasted days, weeks, months you know, because I took a shortcut rather than doing it the way I should have the first time, the right way, right? Yeah, and I think many of us sometimes confuse intelligence with judgment. And what I mean by that is I, I do believe that very, very intelligent people are quite prone to burnout because they have a tendency to push themselves very, very hard and to seek a um, very prestigious profession, which in itself is quite a, a noble quest but they don't realize that if you do burn out, when you do burn out, because it's more of a when than an if, if you work at that pace, your judgment will actually become so impaired that you'll not only not produce your greatest work, but you'll make really bad life decisions. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, exactly. I made a ton of them when I was burning out. And I'm not just talking about a legal mistake in a paper that I submitted at four and a half AM, I'm talking about, you know, being in a very toxic marriage, for example, where because I became numb with the level of pain that I normalized in my day to day life, I was addicted to painkillers, sleeping pill, and even that didn't work at one point. I kind of became numb to pain at home too. And I think that's extremely dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, yeah, it's exactly right. And, and oftentimes it's, it's not just numb to pain, it's that we're distracting ourselves from the pain by mm. overworking, right? Mm. And so then the source of the pain is still there, like 
the dysfunctional relationship, dysfunctional marriage, but we're not dealing with that because that is uncomfortable and we're busy. So we're just going to focus on work because work is, doesn't have the same problems that we might have to deal with in our relationship. So rather than just deal with the relationship, we work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that is, is what kind of feeds the cycle. Um, it's in a lot of these cases, uh, we work with folks, we work with, um, we do founders therapy in my clinic and we work with people who are extraordinarily successful and extraordinarily stressed out, burnt out all the time. And, and your story that you describe is extremely common. You're not by any means the only one who's been through this. And it's really just about reminding people that there are ways to solve some of these problems earlier and to tackle them without distracting or numbing ourselves to them with other things. And it can go quite far. Um, I often have clients that go as far as saying, maybe it would be easier if I wasn't around. So, you know, escape fantasies, they're not necessarily clinically suicidal, but they are contemplating things that they could do to tap out or even contemplating very severe forms of self-harm. I've had a client that actually uh, purposefully broke a leg before a meeting not to go to the meeting because he figured out, oh, it would be easier to go to the emergency room than to go and face that meeting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that from a psychological perspective? What happens when your mind goes this far? Yeah, I mean, it's it's more common than we think, you know, like you probably, I don't know if this is something, I, you went to, where did you go to school growing up? Cambridge University and Panthéon Assas. So. What, what, what about when you were really young? In, oh, in, when I was really young, I was in France. In France, right? Mm -hmm. So this might have been different in France than in, because I think France has a, from my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's a more like nurturing educational system there for young children, but in the U.S., it's very common for kids to do what you just said, right? I have a test. I have a test at the, uh, at the end of the week. I have a paper due. I haven't finished it. I'm not ready for the test. I'm going to figure out how to get sick, get injured, call in sick, something, right? That prevents me from having to do this right now because I'm not ready. How many times have people thought these thoughts? I know I've had those thoughts. I haven't done it. But I have had those thoughts. Um, I have, I have, you know, known people who have made themselves so sick with stress that they believe they are sick, and then they call in sick before an exam or a, or a paper because to get out of it, right? It's not that far of an extension to go from that kind of thought process to the thought process of if I just figure out a way, if I just go get into the emergency room, I have a medical emergency of some sort. I don't have to show up for this meeting or do this presentation that I'm not ready for. I won't have to do it. I'll buy myself extra time. Right. And that's literally sacrificing your, it's, it's self-sabotage to the point of sacrificing your own health for work, right. In a very direct way. Um, the gain, if there's, people do it because there's a perceived gain, you gain time to complete the thing that you weren't ready, didn't feel you were ready for. Right. Or you don't get the shame or the blame. So the reason my client broke his leg is because he felt that at the organization he was working for, calling in sick would be being the weak link. But if something dramatic like breaking a leg happened, nobody yeah. can blame him. That's an accident, right? It's right. quite rough and quite tough to blame someone from breaking a leg. So yeah. there is no way he could admit that he needed maybe one day off maybe two days off without yeah. justifying it to his boss that felt like an impossible task but saying hey i'm in the hospital with a broken leg well you know what can you say about that right yeah exactly but we i think my um you're you're spot on and i think my point being is that part of the reason why we do this stuff or why we even think that it's a, it, it, it is acceptable or a good idea to do that kind of thing is because many of us are taught to think that way in school. Yes. Right. Like early, early on in our training, in our, of, of, you know, learning how to become an adult, we're learning in school that it's okay to do it because other people do it. Mm. And, and because you can't get in trouble for it. If you call in sick and, you're, and somebody writes you a note, 
you know, for a test, what are they going to say, right? They can't tell you you're not sick, get into school, right? They say, especially now that now with COVID, they're like, oh, well, you're sick, stay home, right? Make up the test later. So we're teaching kids how to think this way very young. And, and if we reward them and show them, hey, you can get away with this, then we start to learn that that's a coping strategy that's acceptable. And then it can take the extreme of, for example, what happened with your client. And do you think there are personality types that make us more prone to this mode of thinking? Maybe, you know, we tend to talk about type A's or overly ambitious or high achievers or perfectionists. Do you, do you see a trend there or pattern or? I don't know about that. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if there's any data on that. I'm, I'm sure if you were to, you know, if you were to look hard enough and study enough people, you would probably find trends, but, but I think it's more about learned behavior. Learned you know, like, hmm. yeah. So like it's, if you, if you grow up learning that it's, it's acceptable to avoid the potential of discomfort by doing these kinds of activities, right. Then if that's, a, if that's what you learn is okay, because your parents modeled it for you or other kids modeled it for you or someone you saw on TV did it or whatever it is, right. If you learn that behavior is okay, then you're more, and then you do it once and it works for you you're going to do it again, mm, mm. right? Why wouldn't you do it again? It worked, you know? It's like um, kids who, sh you know, kids who shoplift, right? Like every kid grows up learning that shoplifting is stealing is wrong, right? We teach it to every kid. And yet there are kids who want things they don't have or can't afford. So what do they do? They're like, I'm going to go into my the store and I'm going to steal something. If they get caught the first time, generally speaking, they don't do it again. If they don't get caught the first time, they've just learned that they can get away with this behavior and that they get rewarded for it because now they have the thing that they coveted and wanted that they couldn't have before because they couldn't afford it, right? So if we teach people and show people that there is accountability in that you can't, you, this is not acceptable behavior, right? And the, the adults, it's up to us, the adults, the parents, the community to model this right to model that stealing and cheating and lying are wrong if we model that and then act that way then we are showing kids that they can get away with it too so why wouldn't they do it right like look at so many examples of this worldwide where people like uh i mean there's so many people like elizabeth holmes um with theranos right like lying about uh, her technology working and raising billion, billion dollars and then stealing a bunch of money. Um, the Enron scandal, uh, Arthur, the Arthur Anderson, um, uh, what's it called? The, you know, all these big financial banking scandals in the US with mortgages, subprime rate mortgages and, and you know, all of this stuff. And then the, the um, Bernie Madoff and the Bitcoin guy who just got, you know, I forgot his name, but who lied, you know, and lost like a trillion dollars of people's money or something like that. All these people get away with most of it for a really long time. So you just think about like, what message are we sending to children? We're sending a very clear message. It's, this is okay. If he can do it, I can do it. Right? Yeah. And if we bring that conversation back to anxiety and burnout, if a power couple is role modeling, mommy's too busy to talk to you, daddy doesn't have time to sit at the breakfast table. Well, there is a very high likelihood that that child is going to model that behavior and or develop forms of psychological trauma because they didn't have the love from their primary caretaker. Exactly. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and the, and I think we underestimate the power of that role modeling because it's yeah. all it's all like subliminal subconscious and but we're humans. So like we're, we're like humans are learning machines. So we absorb all of that information and it changes the way we understand the world even though we may not be aware of how it's shifting our understanding of the world, but when you see somebody do something and get away with it and make a bunch of money or or have great success, when they're doing things that are illegal or unethical or just frankly, uh, you know, dehumanizing or whatever we want to call it, and they get away with it, it, it sends a very bad message 
to everyone else around that says, hey, this is okay. This is acceptable behavior. This is condoned, right? You can do this too. And you can also have great success if you do, right? But that's not necessary. That's not what we want to teach people. That's not a path to happiness into a happy, healthy, successful, uh, integrated community and society. That's a path towards societal destruction, right? It's a path literally towards me at all costs, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if I, if I, how many people I have to mow down on the way to success, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get to success because that's what I saw other people do and look how much money they have, right? Do you have concerns around the psychological well-being of children that grew up in families of very high, what I would call high functioning, anxious parents, right? So they're super successful, they're very wealthy, but they're constantly stressed and they really don't see their kids grow up. Do you have concerns around the impact that that can have on those kids? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think, I, although I will say, yes, I have concerns, but I think that I know a lot of those people who are my colleagues, my friends, who have done incredible jobs raising their kids, mm -hmm. right? It's not because they're high functioning and busy that their kids wind up struggling. It's because the way they deal with it when their kids are having a hard time and how present are they, right? So, or, and who are the other adults in the room when they're not there, right? Is it no one or is it another adult who is responsible, who embodies the values of the family, right? And can help that kid, that child learn to cope with stress in a healthy way. Mm. So to give you an example, Please. regardless of socioeconomic status, education, or anything, doesn't, whatever your background is if you have a child and that child's upset and rat and if you if you don't say to that child hey i'm you know tell me how you're feeling what's going on let's talk about it right it's okay to feel the way you feel let's let's talk about it what's going on if you and and just make them feel okay to feel like safe to feel their feelings and get them out if we don't do that and instead we say oh you're upset you're crying whatever take my phone take my iPad, right? What you've just done is you've handed somebody who is feeling uncomfortable, who doesn't necessarily have yet learned the words, hasn't yet learned the words to describe their discomfort, which is the role of the adults, is to give children the language to describe their emotions because the language is how we understand emotions and get them out, mm. right? So rather than giving them the language and helping them understand what they're feeling so they can learn how to process it naturally, go for a run, take a breath, go take a nap, go sit in your room, read a book, whatever it is, the natural way to do it. Um, we just hand them a phone or an iPad, right? So then what, do you, what happens is that child learns from a very young age to do the addictive behavior that you and I were talking about we want to avoid in the beginning, which is to instantly numb myself or distract myself from my discomfort, I can just do this, yes. right? That's yeah. it. And That's it. that, yeah, that single behavior, regardless of that single strategy of giving a child a device when they're upset, a screen when they're upset for instant gratification is more, I would argue that psychologically speaking, that action is more detrimental than almost any other single thing that we could do to children in their formative emotional years because it teaches them to numb and distract themselves from their feelings, not to mm -hmm. understand and process and release their feelings, right? It does the exact opposite of what we are supposed to be teaching children. And so those kids grow up seeking relief from discomfort immediately and they never learn how to focus and they never learn how to breathe properly and they never learn how to how to cope with stress and discomfort they learn every time i'm uncomfortable find whatever it is i can around me as quickly as possible to make that feeling stop and it doesn't matter how healthy or unhealthy it is just find it as fast as possible remember impulse trains impulse right yeah I love that you brought that up. I recently worked with a client suffering from type 2 diabetes who was really struggling with 
serious weight gain that was affecting his cardiovascular health and there was a potential risk for comorbidities and even early death and he actually said within the context of a timeline therapy where we work through that his earlier memories of feeling loved were his mom giving him sugar and biscuits whenever he would cry and I'm not blaming the mom in any way shape or form but I'm just saying that that one event created a chain response that continued for the rest of his life and as a grown adult at night in bed he would soothe with sugar because that's yep. how he felt love exactly that's exactly it yeah so to bring us on a positive note to end the show <laughs> i have enjoyed this conversation so much dr dave i, I could really talk to you all day but i'm conscious of uh, your schedule could you give us perhaps one positive <laughs> thought, one quick strategy that we could just take home today. If we're feeling super anxious, we've had a rough day and we just want to do one thing that is going to help us shift from distress to your stress and from anxiety to a bit more calm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I'll, I'll give you two. So oh, bonus. <laughs> yeah. So, so the first, the first one is, is gratitude. And understanding that the practice of gratitude is actually like training a muscle in your body. Like it's like training your biceps, doing like curls or your legs, doing squats. It's a real muscle. And the more that we find practice finding gratitude for things in ourselves, like just waking up today and getting here and showing up or taking a breath right now or everything I did to get here or for just our family, our friends, right? Things in our lives. The more we spend time thinking about the world from the perspective of what I can be grateful for, the more grateful we feel, the more joy and love we feel. It's literally a pot. It resets the feed, the feedback loop of worry and distress because grat the expression of gratitude is something that we always have control over, just like our breath and gratitude and breath play really nicely hand in hand together. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I can take a breath right now that in any moment, the second thing that I can do is I can be grateful for the opportunity to take control my attention and take that breath. And then I can take another breath and then I can be grateful for that breath, right? And I can keep going as often as I want. And that gratitude does not require any strong amount of effort and doesn't require any tools or any um, spending of money or anything like that. You can literally take it wherever you go. So that's the number one tip. Uh, on that note, uh, Dr. Dave, I would like to ask you because I read a paper and I would like to know from a neuroscientific standpoint if this is valid, that you could not be both grateful and anxious at the same time within your brain. Like it's almost not quite possible to feel super anxious and super grateful at all at once. Is, is there a truth there or is that oversimplified? So so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's somewhat true. I haven't read that exact paper, so it's possible that it's, that it's very true. I would say based on the neuroscience, what I would tell you is that it's true from the perspective of we only have enough attention to pay attention to one thing at a time, right? We talk about multitasking, but multitasking is really, ta it's really task staggering, right? Like it's mm -hmm. doing to multitask properly, you spend all of your time doing one thing and then you switch. It's task switching. You then you spend all of your time on the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing and then you switch back, right? But you're not dividing your attention because if you divide your attention, then we make mistakes because we're not paying attention enough to the, what we're trying to do. So that's why that's why people who multitask wrong make mistakes. True multitasking is actually switching but you're hundred percent on with whatever you're doing at any time. So if we understand how the brain works there, then we only have so much time in every moment to pay attention to anything. So if you think about it again, attention as a, a time limited resource, like in this moment, I can pay attention to you completely, or I can pay attention to my breath, or I can pay attention to whatever else being grateful or worrying, but it's the same amount of time it takes to pay attention to being anxious as it does to be grateful, right? To pay attention to something I'm worried about or out of control of, or to spend time thinking about being in, in something I'm in control of, like expressing gratitude for my breath. 
So if you think about attention as a finite resource, then we only have so much time to pay attention to stuff. If we say, if we say, Hey, I'm, I'm noticing, I'm having awareness that I'm worrying right now. I'm being, I'm feeling anxious about all these things that are out of my control. I'm going to just notice that. I'm not going to judge myself for it. I'm just going to notice it. I'm going to let it go. And then I'm going to reclaim my attention to focus on what I can be grateful for right now. Then you are in fact switching your entire brain's attention to being grateful and leaving nothing else left for anxiety and worry, right? You're taking everything out, all, your entire brain, which might be in the future or the past, and you're bringing it back into the present with gratitude and your breath. And you're saying, you're saying, I'm here now, right? I'm grateful for being here now. And so, yes, to that extent, yes, you're right. That you are able to, to leave anxiety and switch to gratitude. Um, one of my friends um, would say that fear and love and everything in between exist in every single moment, right? Think about that. Fear and love and everything in between exist in every single moment. It's up to us to choose what part of that spectrum we want to pay attention to in any moment. If we pay attention to things that are to the fear side of the spectrum, it's the same moment, but we're now afraid. If we pay attention to the loving side of the spectrum, it's the same moment, but now we feel love and safe, right? So it's really up to us. And, I, and, the, and the last thing that I'll give everybody, because I know that a lot of these tools I'm talking about most people have probably heard before, but they are sometimes hard to start practicing because you've never really known that there was a neuroscience of how this works and there is, and this is well-founded in research, but we created a tool to make this easier for people. Um, and that tool is called Apollo and I'm wearing it on my chest uh, and it delivers gentle vibrations that feel like a hug to your body. And you can wear it anywhere on your body uh, and it helps you feel like you're taking those five seconds in, five seconds out deep breaths and trains your body in the background with whatever you're doing. Mine's on right now. You can't hear it, um, but it trains your body to get into that state of safety and control. Mm -hmm. And it helps you feel what it feels like to be in that state if you don't remember what it feels like to be in that state. And if you uh, are listening to this and you're like, that sounds interesting, I want to try um, and you have an iPhone, you can go to the Apple app store right now and just download the Apollo Neuro app. It's two words, A-P-O-L-L-O -L -L -O space N-E-U-R-O. And when you download this app, you just open it and then wait till you see a feel Apollo button on the screen and just click feel Apollo and free on us, your phone will be upgraded to deliver these soothing vibrations to your body that actually induce these natural states of breathing and gratitude for you. And they'll train you when you just hold it to your chest for a couple of minutes or put it on your yoga mat next to you. It trains your body how to get into that state. Even if you've never been there before, or you don't remember being there before, it trains you how to get back. Uh, and so that is the practical tool I'll leave everybody with that I think is really this fun is because awesome. Yeah, because, because just download now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, it, and it's important to end on a positive note because I think it what is. people don't, you know, what people don't realize is that this is the most exciting as all the challenges that we're, we have in front of us and that we're facing now, there's never been a more exciting time in the field of mental health ever. There is more great discoveries out of technology and medicine than we've ever had. And health is going to get better, but we have to use the technology properly to get better, to, to make things go in the right direction. We have to, we have to leverage technology to get, help us get there, not to make us more miserable, right? We shouldn't be building technology that we serve, that makes our lives harder. We should be building technology that serves us, that makes our lives easier, right? Mm -hmm. And so we developed Apollo as an example of that, that anybody can try from the comfort of your Apple mobile device, wherever you are. Well, Dr. Dave, I just really want to share my gratitude because now we know how good it is for us. So, you know, I want to share that and uh, also really uh, share my gratitude for giving us the tool of Apollo. I know it's going to be super helpful to everyone downloading it. So I'm really, really grateful for that and for a very inspiring conversation today. Thank you. Of course. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care.
Thank you for listening to today's episode with Dr. Dave, and I hope you benefited from his insights as much as I have. Now, I have a little gift for you. If you want to explore Dr. Dave's work further and try out the Apollo wearable, which I really recommend, whether you're looking to improve your sleep, to feel more relaxed, more often, to optimize your focus, then follow the link in the show notes and be sure to use your exclusive discount code Charlene Giselle at checkout for a super special discount. I hope you will enjoy Apollo and let's optimize your focus, improve your sleep and relax a little bit more every day. Thank you. And as ever, if you've enjoyed today's show, I would be so grateful if you could make sure that you give us a review and a rating. It really helps to improve our conversations every week to grow the show. And this show's success is in your hands. So thank you and see you next Wednesday. Mm -hmm.